Southwestern family of companies welcomes you to the Action Catalyst. Each week, our diversely and amazingly accomplished guests share their insights and inspirations to help us ignite our own. So let's invest attention together to breathe, to reflect and refocus, and decisively defeat that voice we call Mr. Mediocrity. Then let's enjoy moving forward to make a positive difference in our world. Privileged to be your host, this is Dan Moore. We are excited to share our guest with you today. Douglas Ward is a retired military veteran with 24 years of distinguished service. During his time, he held numerous leadership roles to include instructor and manager of over 500 personnel. Additionally, Douglas was the troop chief for a hand-selected group of special communicators who supported and deployed into austere environments with special operations forces. Pulling from his past military experience, and as an executive level technology leader, he collaborates with those in charge, providing unfiltered truths on the true state of a company. He specializes in encouraging the development of communication skills from the top down and bottom up, increasing revenue growth, employee trust, and ownership. Douglas has built many successful teams by helping them to navigate through rough seas and land on a foundation based on a steadfast vision. Enjoy this episode. Well, Douglas Ward, welcome to the Action Catalyst. It's great to have you with us today. Great to be here. Well, you've had an amazing background. You've served our country in so many ways. You've been involved in technology field, and now you're helping organizations do better. Could you share a bit of... Uh, sort of the major pivot points in your life that sort of got you first into the military, some of the directions you took there and, and things that have led you to the point you are now where you're such a leadership developer of people. One, you know, when I was younger, my father was military. Um, I came from a military uh, family. My grandfather served in World War II. And always being around military personnel growing up, everyone's father, wore a uniform or their, you know, some, uh, and some, uh, people's mothers. And the thing that I always saw was there was a lot of direction and a lot of camaraderie. I was exposed when I was on Okinawa, I saw the Marines and my father was air force. So that kind of caused a little bit of a, a little, uh, chasm there. Right. Mm -hmm. And as I got into high school, we left Okinawa, I went into high school uh, right outside St. Louis. And one of the things that always stuck in my head was how the Marines presented themselves, just the way they walked, the way they talked. It was, you could just see them exude confidence. And I thought to myself, that's, that's what I want to be. I want to be like that. Um, I also liked the Marines mission. And what I did was I was in high school and I did not, apply myself. I was a kid in school. I was smart enough to get straight A's, but I didn't even apply myself. So I was one of the guys as it came near graduation, I was going into my senior year and my recruiter pulled me aside. He said, Doug, you have to have a high school diploma to join the Marines. Now your GED is not going to cut it. And I'm thinking, Hmm. And I hadn't got a GED, but it had crossed my mind. So that's when I was thinking to myself, and I wanted it so bad. So then I kind of got it together and I still, you know, I made it through graduation and six months later went off to boot camp and served in the Marine Corps. And the funny thing is, is I never saw myself as a leader. I wanted to be a Marine. When I look back, my wife and I were having this discussion last night. I had a fear when I first became a leader. Because when you're first being put in charge of people, especially your peers at a young age, it puts you in a position where you have to step up and you just don't know how these guys are going to react to you. You know, I was in an all male unit. The guys were squared away, really had it going on. And I was lucky because my peers, some of them had said, hey, I would want you supporting me. Some of them were mature enough at, at that time, if you believe it or not. I mean, you're, you're talking 19, 20, 21. And that's what helps when you're a leader is having that young support. The guys that didn't succeed is because people just didn't support them. Hmm. 
And that's one of those things. So, you know, and I was telling my wife, she said, what do you mean you were scared? I said, yeah, I was scared. I was scared that I was going to fail as a leader. And I was, and that would, that would have meant I was a failure as a Marine. Hmm. And once I got past that and was able to understand that, yeah, I can do this as a leader. It really helped my growth. Right. You know, it's hard for anybody to be objective about themselves, but obviously there were things in you that caused you to win that respect of, of your men. Can you identify now some of the traits that you were exhibiting early on that caused your command to feel comfortable promoting you and caused you to win that respect, respect and support? I think a lot of it is, are you there to support them? You have to be a good follower first. Hmm. You know, you want to be a great leader. What were you doing as a follower? What were you doing to help support the leadership that was there? Now, I'm not talking about blind loyalty, but what were you doing to actually support them? You know, the greatest followers also provide pushback to the leadership. They make leadership think. Some of the greatest people I've ever worked with, one of the things they always did was we had internal discussions and it was up to the leader to basically make the final call on what was going to happen. When you're a leader, a lot of times all you're doing is you are the, you're kind of like the coach on the football field. You know, you've got your quarterback, you've got your wide receivers, you've got, your, you know, all this stuff going on. You're kind of managing all of it. Of mm -hmm. course, your leadership comes out when there's some tough decisions that have to be made. Very true. So first of all, being a, being a good follower, which means the willingness to speak up and state your opinion honestly. But at the end of the day, when the decision's made, you support it and you do everything you can to help make it go right. Correct. So I think that's fantastic. Well, you were in for quite a long time, 24 years in the military. Yes. Uh, it served in many different roles in leadership, uh, special communicators, uh, some difficult environments that you were working in. Can you share some things that that might help us all learn how to be more adaptable and more flexible in rapidly changing circumstances. Cause I'm sure you had a lot of those. First off, you have to have a uh, never quit attitude. You have to understand that things are going to change and they're never going to go as planned. And you always have to, in your mind, understand that you might not have a backup in place, but you're going to have to think of something quickly and how you do that. And with the gentleman that I was stationed with and I've, I've had the privilege to serve with, and, you know, not just the gentleman, but, you know, there were some females that worked for me in my last command that were specially screened for the special communications, and they were very good. But we built a culture of innovation. We built a culture of think quickly on your feet. No decisions bad. We will go back and we will re-engineer or reverse engineer the decisions that were made and maybe you could have made something uh, happen a lot better. But what happens a lot of times is you, you're not there when those things are happening. So you, you want to support the people that are working for you and understand where their decision-making process was. And if there is a problem, then that's when you go back and you address it. Mm -hmm. But a lot of times to be able to think quickly on your feet, you have to have an, uh, a situation and a culture that you're incubating and everybody understands, especially when people are just coming into it. Sometimes in the standard military, they don't have the ability to think outside the box mm. In special operations. You have to think outside the box. That's why when you look at special forces or the Navy SEALs, they have to be able to make decisions quickly on the fly and their commanders always support them unless they do something that's just completely out of line, which is usually never, they will be supported up the chain of command. It's because no one is there. They were on the ground. They were there. And when the situation happened, they made the call. Mm -hmm. Now, of course, you know, that's when you always get the armchair quarterbacks. I've always told guys, Hey, were you there? If you weren't there, let's dig in on this and figure out what happened. But sometimes there was no other decision to be made. The decision made was the, the correct call at that time. Mm -hmm. So the lesson for leaders is to support the people that are closest to the issue. Don't prejudge their decisions, get into why they made them. And uh, in general, they've got more knowledge because they're right there. Exactly. There was a recent article. Um, I was reading 
I think it was with, um, I'm trying to think here, Inc. Magazine. Is either Inc. or Business Insider. And I remember seeing it online. Maybe I'm, I'm wrong on the magazine. But President Trump had actually pulled a whole bunch of Navy SEALs, special operators in a room, kicked all the officers out, and all, you know, all the generals, admirals, those types. He was basically sitting down and asking them, what is really going on? Hmm. And when they all left the room, and when the generals and admirals came back in, he basically looked at him and said, you're not telling me everything. You're not telling me the truth. The troops are saying one thing, you're telling me another thing. You know, we've been at war, we're going on two decades. That's a long time to be at war. We've never been on that type of footing in this country's history. So those are things that have to be looked at. For example, on LinkedIn, I see some of these generals, maybe some admirals might put out some post or an article that they were quoted in. But when you read the article, you're thinking to yourself, yeah, that's great. And I really respect that you were a general. The greatest leaders I've ever met, 99% of them were not the officers. There was a few officers and one of them was a Navy SEAL officer, Jason Lamb. He was a great leader, one of my last commander. But most of the officers I worked with, the greatest leaders I ever have been around were the troop chiefs, the non-commissioned officers, the platoon sergeants. Those are the people that have to get their troops to do the tough jobs and do it with a smile. Mm -hmm. Do it with all their heart and all their enthusiasm. That's, right. that's fantastic. Um, one of the things that, that everybody that achieves anything runs into, of course, Doug, are roadblocks, brick walls. Um, can you, can you think of a time when you were just rolling along, things were going great in your career, and then all of a sudden out of the blue, blindsided by something and, and strategies for dealing with it when suddenly you're confronted with something that you've just never been confronted with before? There's two I can think of. One was individual tasks where I got presented with almost taken over for my boss because he was about to get fired. But at the time, we had been in an environment where we had not slept in days. We had to get a communication center up and running in record time. And we only had three people to do that. And when that was coming up, we had 24 hours downtime. And during that downtime, operations were going to shift to another location. So we stayed back. We were doing everything we could to get this up and running. We finally got up and running. We didn't make the timeline, but for the three people to do what we did in the time we did it was phenomenal. It involved us three communications personnel. I think three CVs came in and it was just a great job. The problem was we didn't meet that timeline. When I got asked by the commander, he turned and looked at me and asked me, my nickname was Danger. And he said, Danger, what do you think your chief? And we knew our chief was kind of on the bubble of possibly getting sent back to the United States and special mm -hmm. operations. That's what they would do. You, they wouldn't move you to some other location in the combat zone. They, they would just send you back to the United States. And that was an ultimate slap in the face and basically a career ender. Yeah. And when he asked me that, it's kind of that moment of truth where I thought to myself and you know, I was paused, I was kind of quiet. And then I said to him, sir, if you send him home, you're ruining a good person, a good sailor. We might not get along with him, but he's done everything he can. What he needs right now is some sleep. A day later, the chief and I went for a walk and he just got emotional. He said, what did you say to the commander? You saved my career. And I, I didn't think anything of it at the time. All I did was I did what I thought was right. Mm -hmm. and I did what I thought I would want my troops to do for me. Everyone was under high stress. It was a very rapid evolving uh, environment. And that was just really, to me, that was, I look back and I guess that was a character defining moment. Mm -hmm. I guess some people would call it for myself. It was just a moment of truth. Yeah. 
How old were you when that happened? I was 35. Extremely young, difficult situation, and you could have certainly thrown the crew chief under the bus, but you did the honest thing. Correct. And, and the, the thing, truth. exactly. And the thing was, that his job was a good chance it was going to become mine. Mm -hmm. I could have taken that road and I chose not to. Well, the lesson there is do the right thing and have the courage of your convictions. So when you're hit with a brick wall, just realize there's got to be a right thing to do and I'm going to do it to the best of my ability. Sounds like that's what you've focused your career on. Correct. And, you know, the, uh, the second story would have been when I was a troop chief. One of the things I told my guys, I brought in some guys from special, another special operations command. And I recruited them specifically to come there. And I just thought I was delegating like I should have. And it got to a point about three months after they were all there. So I was a chief amongst chiefs. I was the lead dog, the head manager. They called, we had a meeting, they called me in the room. They basically said, Doug, why are we here? You're not letting us do anything. And when I look back, they were right. And basically what it boiled down to is they all wanted to leave because they thought I wasn't delegating or I didn't trust them. Hmm. I just was not delegating with trust. Now you can delegate with trust and you always follow up and make sure they understand things. I mean, there's always follow up. You have to make sure the task and the things are getting done that need to, but I just didn't delegate with trust at all. So here it was, I was working 16 hour days complaining to myself in my mind that no one else is helping me, but I wasn't letting anybody help me. Now I had all these other capable, experienced communicators and I just wasn't letting them help me. Once we did have that discussion, we went out to lunch. We divided those tasks up after that. Not only did it improve my quality of life because my work hours went down from 16 to 12. And my mindset was totally reset. Now I knew that you have to trust your people. Don't bring in pipe hitters if you're not going to let them swing the pipe. Hmm. Yeah, that's fantastic. And a lot of times people that have a good opinion of their leadership have a hard time delegating because they believe they're the only one that can actually do it right. And there's a fear of delegating because somebody won't do it correctly and you'll get the blame. But it takes faith and it takes trust and realizing they're good people out there. So well done. Correct. Wait, you are our head of Anchor Strategies. You help organizations deal with all kinds of uh, issues that they face. You help build teams with them. How did you make that transition from military into, into a business career? Even though in some ways you're doing the same thing, but it's with very different bullets flying around. Correct. What I've done is I retired out of the military. I worked some contracting work for the military at McDill Air Force Base for about almost two years. And then I went into industry, but it was the defense industry. And I was working my last job and it had dawned on me after all the leadership and the different things I had seen over time, even in the corporate world, it's just like the military. You will have toxic work environments. The leader, you know, the military has it, corporate world has it. It's the same thing. There's good leaders, there's bad leaders. I found myself in a position where didn't really like where I was at some toxic leadership. I felt like maybe there wasn't some things they were being upfront about. I started making the mental note in my head. It is time to start moving. And then once left the company, that's when I uh, decided to go into leadership development and going in where you can talk to companies and actually from experience, and help them understand exactly what's going on. For example, on a toxic work environment, you have overt toxic where you can just see, maybe you have a bad manager. Everybody knows when that person's in the room, then there's the under the table, which I would call under the surface toxic behavior. And that's where you would have, for example, what I did, 
I was in delegating with trust. That's mm. actually toxic to the workplace. If those guys would have left, the effort it would have taken to get the experience of those type of people back in would have been catastrophic to the mission at the time. And it's the same thing in business. When you have workers leaving, that's the first indication that something's wrong in management. You have to address that. Mm -hmm. Is it the manager? Was the manager trained? Did you just, for example, sales organizations can be some of the worst. They like to take their best salesperson and make them a manager. Hey, we're going to make this guy the boss because he's going to make everybody else a superstar. That usually doesn't pan out 99% of the time. That just does not pan out. If that person is your superstar, it's because they're very good at working by themselves. Can they be a manager? Sure. But you've got to train them. You've got to send them into some type of leadership program. Mm -hmm. Whether you're going to do that locally at the company or you're going to take them and let them see through like a leadership boot camp or a program or assign a leadership coach, hire a coach for them and say, hey, we're going to assign this person to you. We're paying money for this. You need to listen because they're going to help you understand. So when you come back to the company, how to deal with the employees, how to deal with personalities. The X factor in leadership, it's never easy. Any leader who says it's easy, they don't know what they're talking about. The X mm. factor is you are dealing with human beings. You've got to understand that. And a lot of people, they fear dealing with other human beings. I don't have time for this. I don't have time for that. Do they make eye contact with you? If they're not making eye contact with you. There's big problems right there. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So a couple of the signs of what you call toxic work environments. One is where you don't delegate with trust. And then when you have employee turnover, we shouldn't be looking at the employees. We need to be looking at the leader. Correct. Any other signs of a toxic work environment that you could uh, list for us? not listening to the ideas of your employees. When they stop talking, there's a problem. Mm. If you have everybody and you bring them in, for example, in your division, and you're having a discussion that relates to, does anyone have ideas about a new technology or new software, something that can make us more efficient, and everyone just looks around like they're not interested, it's because they're usually implanted with something in their mind that tells them, if I speak up, no one's going to hear it or someone else is going to take credit. Give credit where credit's due. When you hear that silence, that's never a good thing. Mm -hmm. You want those ideas. Those are the ideas that propel companies the next five, 10 years down the road for profitability and sustainability. Mm -hmm. Any ideas on how you can get people that are in that silent mode to feel comfortable contributing? Because sometimes a manager will take over for a group. That's their culture is they don't speak up. The new manager wants to do a better job. Any ideas on how to get people just to open up? The biggest thing is on getting the managers and training your managers to understand it's not about you. It's about your people. When you do that, you're instilling the credit goes to the workers, the managers. It's not about you. If you're looking to become that next vice president, if you're looking to move up, if you take care of your division, your department, your production facility, whatever it is that you're in charge of, it's going to show in the bottom line, mm -hmm. the bottom line is going to show if you're taking care of your people, because not only are you taking care of your people, they're taking care of the customers. It's a ripple effect that goes all the way down. That's the biggest thing is you have to understand as a manager, it's not about you anymore. That's how we did things in the Navy. When I was in the Navy, you know, I switched over from the Marines, I retired in the Navy. And the thing we did is when you were a Navy chief or a senior chief or a master chief, but we all met at least once a week, we'd compare notes. We'd talk about management strategies. Maybe if we had a, person that was a problem and one of the managers just wasn't getting along with one of his troops or one of his people. Hey, would you mind Doug coming over and talking to this person? I know they kind of look up to you. I'm trying to get through to him and he's, uh, he's becoming a problem. No problem. I have no issue with that. 
And I would go and sit down with that person. Hey, what's going on? Is there something going on at home? Is there something going on between you two? You know, we need to air this out. It's affecting work. Those were things we used to do as the senior managers and junior executives. We would get together and compare notes. A lot of managers don't want to compare notes within companies because they feel as though they're exposing weaknesses. Mm -hmm. Everyone has weaknesses. If you open up, it's going to make you a better leader. What you're doing is you're actually halting your growth as a leader when you do not open up and talk to other managers. Mm -hmm. So realizing it's about people and where they're coming from, and if we can dissolve some of those barriers, they're going to open up, start to produce a lot more. It can't be just because you're the leader and you say, do it because I say, do it. Absolutely. Yeah. Especially in a time when there's all kinds of work options for people the do what I say mentality doesn't go very far and it gets at best limited commitment. Absolutely correct. I think it's great. Um, Doug, you've obviously been a self-motivated individual ever since you figured out you needed to graduate from high school to get into the Marines. How do you keep your edge? How do you keep, uh, keep striving and not get into a complacent mode of just coasting? I've got other things I want to do in life. I love my time in the military. Uh, obviously, I decided to pull the plug and retire when I did. I could have stayed in longer. But there's other things I want to do in my life, not just for myself, but for my family. And I also want to impact other people. I want to help people not have to go through some of the things I've seen. When a lot of those things can be easily corrected all across industry. Hmm. People shouldn't have to go home. I mean, I've been put in situations where I'm walking down a hallway and I've seen within a three week period of time, three females come walking out of the bathroom and I'd seen them earlier in the day in a boss's office, a vice president. And now here they are coming out of the ladies room and they're bawling hmm. after having been in a room for two hours, basically being threatened with their job. There's no place for that. That it never should have got to that point. Those are the type of things people shouldn't have to go through in the workplace. And the leaders need to understand if you're having a problem talking to people, and yes, there are some bad workers out there, but you need to lean on the other managers. You need to also think you are not the only leader within that company. A company is full of leaders. There's not just one. And the greatest ones are usually the ones at the lower level that have to motivate, persuade, and get people to do their job, get them to show up for overtime when they really don't want to on a Saturday because they want to spend time with their family. Those are your mm -hmm. greatest leaders. The ones, they're the ones who are tasked with having to make those decisions, having to break the news to those workers. How do they do it? How do they break it down? How do they present it to the workers? Right. And actually get them to come into work with a smile on their face. I think that's amazing. So a big part of your motivation is helping people just enjoy their work, enjoy their lives and be better people. I think that's yes. great. That's a mission we can never fulfill, but man, what a motivator. Exactly. Um, over the years, both in military and in business and your personal life, there probably been times when you've just felt completely out of resources. So I'm wondering for our listeners that are, are currently struggling right now, they, uh, they maybe been following a plan, following a path, it's just dead ended on them and they look at the hand they've been dealt and there's not a single face card in there. What advice would you give to people that just, just don't know what to do next in their career, where to turn? I will tell you a big help for me was LinkedIn. Hmm. I was at a point where I was trying to figure out what I wanted to do. I always thought about doing leadership development, having been in different forms of leadership, throughout my career and I was looking at some stuff on LinkedIn. I reached out to some people and just started having discussions. I sent them personal messages, asked them if they had some time to talk and it, one thing led to another. And I just started reaching out to people, not just within the military network on LinkedIn of people, but I started reaching outside my network to others and asking questions. And sometimes getting on phone calls, if some of them were willing to do that. And that really helps. The other thing you need to understand is reach out to people and ask questions. 
put yourself out there and say, this is the situation I'm in. Can you help me? I've seen so many people who sit there and think they have no other options in life. All you have to do is ask people. You might get some no's, but I guarantee you, you're going to get a lot of yeses. If mm -hmm. someone reaches out to me and I have former personnel I served with in the military, I have some that are still in the military that reach out to me for mentorship. They'll call me, say, hey, I have a situation or I'm in this part of my life. What should I do? And I throw some options out there. I don't tell them what to do, but I lay some options out there. I tell them one of the biggest things is, are you really doing what you want to do? And here's the other thing. Who are you? Hmm. Who are you? You know, Simon Sinek says, you know, what's your why? You know, for me, it's more of a, who are you? What is it you want in life? Where do you want to be in 10 years? Are, are there things that you have not done that you want to do? And you can somehow work a career into that. Those are things you need to think about. Think outside the box on sometimes you can work it in to something that you'd want to do that involves travel. If you love to travel, mm -hmm. it might be a career change, but if you have the passion for it, I guarantee you're going to be good at it. Mm -hmm. You just have to find your passion and your, and who are you? Yeah. So no, no, who you are and don't be afraid to reach out to others to ask questions because usually we can't solve a problem just by thinking it through. We need to have external inspiration, external advice, but knowing what you want and then look for people that can help give ideas to help you get there. That's what I hear you saying. Yes. Well, I think that's always encouraging because it's something that everybody can act on. And uh, that's really what we're about. Wow. Time with you goes really fast, Doug. <laughs> you have so many insights to share. Have you got a book that's either out or soon will be? Uh, I'll probably be working on one. I plan on trying to do it within the year. Great. And I'll keep you updated on that. And I'm going to be coming out with a podcast. Super. Probably within the next two weeks. Well, that is fantastic. Well, I'll look forward to reading your book when it does come out. That'll be excellent. So I appreciate it. On behalf of our listeners around the world, thank you so much for sharing your insights and being with us today. Hey, thank you. I really appreciate it. Okay. Take care, Doug. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. If you enjoyed this podcast, please make sure to subscribe. To stay updated on everything that the Action Catalyst is up to, make sure to follow us on Facebook and Instagram at Action Catalyst and Twitter at Catalyst underscore Action. Thanks for listening. This episode is sponsored by Southwestern Coaching. Southwestern Coaching has helped over 12,000 people increase their incomes by over 25% on average. As a successful salesperson, you know the importance of increasing your sales, but sometimes you might just need a little extra push and accountability to meet your goals and grow your business. Southwestern Coaching will help you increase your income through one-on-one -on -one sales and leadership coaching tailored specifically to your needs. Together, we will elevate sales. To schedule your free one-on-one -on -one business action planning session with a Southwestern coach, go to www.southwesternconsulting.com forward slash action catalyst.